Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcella Paris, and as the director of the Lewiston Public Library, I'd like to welcome you all to the Great Falls Forum. The forum is a monthly speaker series in the area of uh, business, public policy, academia, and the arts, and is a partnership of Bates College, The Sun Journal, and the Lewiston Public Library. This year marks the 25th season of the forum. So we thank you for your support and ensuring the program's continued success by being here. Uh, today's program is also streaming live via Zoom and Facebook, and a recording will be available on the library's YouTube page in the coming days. Please visit lplonline.org for more information. And please mark your calendars for our next Great Falls Forum that will be on Thursday, March 16th. And it will be a panel discussion entitled New Developments in Maine Agriculture. So more information on that one will also be available soon on the library's Facebook and website. At the conclusion of today's program, there will be opportunity for audience questions. Those in the room are welcome to raise their hands and we'll run a microphone over to you so that everybody at home can hear you. And those joining us virtually can enter their questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen on Zoom or comment on Facebook and we'll make sure that our presenters get the questions. For those here in person, books by our speakers are available for sale after the talk. And uh, I think they'd be happy to sign them also if uh, you'd like that afterwards. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our featured speakers, Tim and Susan Caverley. Tim is a main author of 11 books. He is a, a member of the New England Outdoor Writers Association, whose stories have been featured in various newspapers, magazines, and outdoor journals. Tim currently serves as a monthly columnist for the Maine Sportsman and contributes to the Act Out section of the Bangor Daily News. He is a graduate of the University of Maine at Machias, and Tim worked for Maine's Department of Conservation for 32 years, ending his career in 1999 as, a, as the Regional Park Supervisor of the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. Susan Caverley is also a graduate of the University of Maine at Machias, worked for 25 years at the Department of Conservation, and afterwards taught in Millinocket. Today, Susan and Tim travel throughout New England, promoting literacy in schools by teaching and learning about Maine's natural world. Through their New England Reads Literacy Project, they have presented 324 programs and counting, I assume, uh, reaching over 10,500 students. Please join me in welcoming Tim and Susan to Lewiston. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we were pleased to hear the kind of day that we we're going to have when we planned last night to come down, knowing what's happening Friday, at least up north of Millinocket. So uh, this is all going to come together. And hopefully we'll try to tell you a story that uh, you've never heard before. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Sue. I really began my career of learning about the Maine woods in Baxter State Park. Uh, my brother's first assignment was at uh, A-Ball Campground. And when he went in there to work, he said, Tim, come on up. There's a mountain climb and brook trout to catch. And I lived with him till every summer till 18 years old until I got my own park ranger's job at Sebago Lake State Park. And I moved throughout the state from there. Eventually uh, going to work on the Allagash. Uh, after Buzz had been at A-Ball campsite for a few years, and this story is in our new book, Conversations. Can you hold that up, Sue? Buzz also has been in the Bangor Daily News and got a number of hits. He got a, a, an opportunity to promote to Russell Pond, which is a 7.2-mile hike where you either carry all your gear in or you have it flown in when the, when the weather is right. In fact, this is a map of Baxter. He went from A-Ball campground right here into remote Russell Pond. So we would park our car at Roaring Brook and we would hike that 7.2 miles uh, to get to his assigned area. At Russell Pond, we had a tame deer. And whenever we hiked in, we always had to carry a couple boxes of saltine crackers. Uh, this is me as a young boy at Russell. No, there's no tobacco in the pipe. But my brother took that picture and told my mother I had to smoke a pipe to keep the black flies away. And it did the trick. I almost didn't get to go back to Baxter after he told her that. Uh, but so we always had a saltine crackers in a backpack when we went into Russell Pond. 
And the reason was for Grandma the deer. She'd come out every night about dusk, and we'd feed her saltine crackers, and then she'd go about her business. And she did that. She was very uh, regular, on time. And then one night she didn't appear. A second night she didn't appear. A third night. Okay, go to the next slide, so I think. And so we got worried. Uh, I take a, I, uh, uh, we got worried that maybe a lynx had attacked her, or maybe a black bear had gotten to her, or something like that. And then the fifth night, I saw a gray flash out behind the kitchen window. Grandma was back in town. So I grabbed some saltine crackers, went down the trail to Roaring Brook, about 100 feet, sat down a rock, and I hollered to her, hey, Grandma, crackers are here. Hollered two or three times. The deer stuck her head out of the woods, looked up and down the trail, and then came out, and I threw a, track, a cracker at her feet. She picked it up. I threw another one closer to me. She picked it up. The third cracker she took out of my hand. Right after she did that, she did a backwards flip and disappeared. What in the world could be going on? Grandma had never done that before. Within a few minutes, she came back and stuck her head out, looked up and down the trail. And when she saw nobody was coming, she stepped off to one side. And this little fellow came out walking out behind her. And he was at the point where he was still nursing, so he couldn't eat hard food, but he liked the smell of salt. And he eventually got close enough to me where he licked the salt off the cracker uh, and without eating the cracker. Um, and after he had two or three licks off a couple of crackers, then grandma took him back in the woods. So that's why she disappeared. And she introduced me to a young when we were both at a very early age. I'm sorry. One of the things in our new book, Conversations, I almost forgot it, is that one of the things that we've done is that we've taken actual diary entries over the years and included them at the end of the chapter of about the 30 different stories that are in the book. And Sue is going to read one of those diaries now by the first Baxter Park supervisor, Helen Taylor. As Tim said, this is from the diary of Helen Taylor. And this is the week of July 9th. 1966, Tuesday, to A-Ball Field and help Ranger Cavalry evict a party with pets. They had one cat, one squirrel, six salamanders, and a turtle. They had been told not to come into the park with their pets, but they sneaked in after the Ranger had gone to bed at night. I can't imagine lugging salamanders around, but everybody do their own taste, I guess. And so now we're going to start the 48 hours with an Allagash Ranger. I just want to give you that background. And I'm not going to try to pretend uh, that everything I'm talking about did happen in a 48-hour period. But I just never knew in the morning when I got up. I might start out in a canoe. I might end up in an airplane. Uh, I might end up on foot going somewhere else or in a re rescue. And sometimes I'd even be in a helicopter going up to uh, deal with a radio repeater on Priestley Mountain. The key is to remember, I'd like to emphasize is this is stuff that happened when we were walking the ground as my wife and I worked up there. And this is our contact information, my, my Gmail account, my phone number, our website. So if anybody's got any questions, um, we also have some information about other programs. We have numerous programs that we do. We'd be happy to share that with you. As Henry David Thoreau said, everybody must believe in something. I believe I'll go canoeing. Sometimes we're at a place where folks have heard of the Allagash, but they're not sure where it is. So that's why we've done this location mark. How about 65 miles northwest of Millinocket is where the Allagash starts. We were at a place in southern Maine one day, and a person raised a hand and said, the Allagash is just outside of Acadia National Park, isn't it? So I broke the news to them just how far away it was, and they seem to be happy with that. And this is me on patrol. And as I said, you just know, I never knew what a day would bring. And we're going to discuss several of them today. I might take a hike up Allagash Mountain, or I might have a close encounter. 
I might find some memorial rocks that have been put on by someone that had passed away and the Allagash was so special to them that they wanted a plaque on a rock. These were put up there before they, it became a state park. And this is a uh, tombstone down to Cunliffe Depot from a guy that died down there in the late 1800s. And he wanted to be left on the bank of the river. And so he's put in two pork barrels and put in the ground. Or I might be summoned by radio to a rescue. This is 40 foot high Allagash Falls, about 16 miles from the end of the canoe trip. And one day there were two girls in a canoe. They approached Allagash Falls. They got here, the canoe got stuck on the rock. They didn't dare to get out. They didn't dare to try to get their canoe off the rock. Fortunately, there was a guy by the name of uh, John White, W-I-G-H-T. He knew what to do. He threw ropes around each one of the girls and they were able to pull them out of the canoe with help and get them to shore. And then they, then the uh, canoe floated down over the falls so the girls would not hurt. But previously to that, there had been a couple canoeing uh, towards Allagash Falls and they got too close to the falls. And the person in the back to stop the canoe from going down over, jumped out of the canoe to jump on land on a rock to pull the canoe back. He missed the canoe, so his partner in the stern went down over the falls and we, we pulled her out several days later. Or I might be on Amzaskis Lake responding to an incident that uh, where a man was sitting on that ledge and he got drinking too much uh, and they found his canoe floating and we found him about nine days later. Or there might be a spruce bud drum plane that came down in the 70s that landed in uh, Eagle Lake. There they're pulling it out of a place called John's Bridge. Or I might respond to an illegal hot tub that was put in without per proper permits too close to the waterline in Round Pond, T13 out of 12. What's that? Oh, okay. Or we might learn about a visitor at uh, Michoud Farm. One day a man pulled into Michoud Farm, the last ranger station on the Allagash. Thank you, so. Yep. <laughs> and he said, they went into the cabin, he said to the woman, he said, uh, take my picture. She was a park receptionist. She says, okay, Wim, I'll take your picture. She went out, he opened the door of his van, pulled out a calf moose. She took his picture and he said, thank you very much and threw the moose back in the van, drove off down the road. There's plenty of characters in the Allagash country. So when I went into the waterway, this is the uh, cabin that we moved into. It once was a VIP cabin for a national paper company. When the citizens of Maine voted to create the Allagash, this cabin was bought from the paper company and became the supervisor headquarters. And we lived there for two years. And I was given three assignments, which I'm going to include in the program today. One, to bring illegal oversized groups uh, into compliance, uh, required that a rogue guide that felt he could do whatever he wanted to do, whatever ever, anybody else wanted him to do, and then take corrective measures for a difficult employee. Before it became a state park in the 50s, there were over 80 camps that took oversized groups down the Allagash. Some of them were, had, would have uh, over 50 students or kids in their canoes and some would last seven weeks they'd actually start at moosehead lake go up through to the west branch of the penobscot end up on the allagash and then perhaps go all the way around and come down to saint john for a ways and so that was part of the problem you can imagine 50 kids on a campsite with up to 80 groups doing that that uh, that trip and how what a combination that would be and how much was done and um, so we, the uh, state tried to control that by limiting group size to 12. But there was still, having a large group is a lot of money. Some today, sometimes $1,000 to $1,500 per person. So there are always those who would like to sneak an extra person or two in. Uh, three miles downstream from Allagash Lake is all is little Allagash Falls. Three miles beyond that is Chamberlain Lake, where a guide sees a bunch canoeing. This is one large group that went through illegally a few years ago. 
This is another diary entry. Uh, this takes place on Chamberlain Lake where this is. Authors note, seagulls have returned to Gull Rock on Chamberlain Lake. Traditionally, ice out has occurred around 30 days after the gulls return. So I'm starting my first day of patrolling on the Allagash, sure to be a hot one. And when I get up in the morning, I, I may not get lunch, even though I may have a cooler with me. I may be so busy trying to take care of somebody or something that I don't have lunch. So I always try to eat a proper breakfast to start out. And this breakfast is a tribute to one of my rangers who was once a lumberjack or river driver, Lee Hafford. He worked in lumber camps and they didn't always have the best of cooling or refrigerated facilities. So sometimes they would get eggs or just a little bit spoiled. And they didn't want to give up that food because it's so hard to get food in there. So they learned if they put enough pepper on it, they could eat it without knowing it was spoiled. So that's what I have for breakfast every morning when I have an egg is a tribute to my friend Lee Hafford. One, one of my uh, duties was to meet with local landowners and foresters to talk about the harvesting operations that they wanted to do to make sure that whatever they were going to do was compatible with the wilderness experience of those visiting the Allagash. And I'm out in the woods one day with the Seven Islands Forest and we hear eek, eek, eek sound. Kind of, we'd never heard that before in the woods. So we get real quiet and we step around some short fir trees and we see a baby moose standing there the mother, after a moose has a baby, she will go off to feed before the baby has a strong scent of its own. So the mother had gone down to the local flowage, the wetland, to get the grasses that she needs to eat and left the baby behind. And the little guy was running around in a circle going, eat, 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 not knowing what we were or what it was or where mom had gone. And so we watched it for a very brief time then backed out of there so we wouldn't scare the, scare the little guy any more than necessary. Then I had assistant ranger, Atley, Ollie Frank. This was a guy that was sent up to me uh, from the coast of Maine. He was an assistant ranger down there. I don't think he'd ever been in a canoe, uh, but they, he was sent to me. And immediately they started having problems. He looked good, he, he talked good, but when it came to actions, he just wasn't good at all. Uh, they were jacking a camp um, on the Allegash. He was working with that. And he took the level in and put it on the wood stove, not realizing there was fire in the wood stove and blew the, bevel, the bubbles out of the level. Now, that doesn't seem that significant until you realize you're 60 to 70 miles away from the hardware store to get a new level. And so uh, they started rising, uh, getting complaints from, from uh, Ollie. And uh, he, was, he was going to groups and trying to get the women to come to his camp. Uh, he was... Uh, he was the only guy that I ever had. We had two-way radios that we carried in the old days, Motorola's, and they had an antenna about that high on them with a little red uh, dot on the end of a plastic dot. He was the only ranger I ever had work for me that tripped and drove the antenna up his nose. That's how bad he was. So the time came to send him home after a lot of complaints of various. And so I called him on the radio one night. I said, I'll be down to your place at 8.30 in the morning. We need to have a discussion. He said, okay. And I got down there at 8.30 next morning, no Ollie. 9 o'clock, no Ollie. 9.30, no Ollie. 9.45, he comes screaming into the yard in his car. He jumps out of his car, and he's got check marks all over his face. And I said, what's happened to you? He said, well, I expect you're probably going to send me to home. I just nodded. I didn't say much. He said, well, my friend over to Daquam came back over last night. He heard, heard the radio traffic, and he said, I think you're going home. I think Jim's sending you home. No, I said, yeah, probably. He said, well, there's a little bar across the border in Daquam. Let's go over and have a celebratory drink tonight. So they went over. Well, he drank too much, and he started making a ruckus, and the, his friend that took him over said, well, i got to get you out of here. He took him out, put him in the trunk in the, on the seat of the truck. They started driving out down the road, and all he kept passing out when we pass out, he's put his head on his friend's shoulder. Well, it's, they were 45 miles from Ollie's camp, and the friend didn't want to put up for that, so he took his fishnet, put it down over Ollie's head, and tied him to the gun rack. 
and he slept all night long with a fishnet over his head. So when he pulled in the next morning, he had these fish, these marks from the fishnet all over his face. And so I'm on patrol from Amzaskas Lake, heading north, and I'm coming onto Long Lake where there's the page camp. And as I look over the page camp, and this this is a camp that was bought when the waterway took over the or the state took over the waterway. It was a private camp that belonged to a Mr. Page, and it was used for volunteer groups and those kind of things. So I look over to the page camp, and I see an open door. And that's not a good sign, because often people that are on a trip, if they were cold, wet, or whatever, if they found an abandoned camp, they would go in and build a fire, and the stove may not be, or the chimney may not be safe to have a fire in. So I went over to look at that open door. And there wasn't anybody there, but the door had been ripped out, or the padlock had been, the hasp had been, had been broken and this is the camp they went in and in the kitchen of the camp there was a huge wagon wheel light and i'll tell you where that wagon wheel came from in a minute and someone had tried to steal that wagon wheel chandelier and when they got up on the chair and climbed up on the table the, it was held by three chains and when they re, when they released two of the chains or unbolted them so it was just hanging from one chain that wagon wheel swung down knocked whoever it was off the table and broke a chair. And so I could tell someone was trying to steal that state property. So I got a, one of my rangers and he came down, helped me and we un, unloaded. I bet that wheel weighed 45, 50 pounds. It was a very heavy wheel. And I took it back and put it in safe storage up to Churchill Dam. And that wagon wheel actually came from construction along Lake Dam. This had a 17 foot head wall of water behind it after it was built in 1907. And one of the things they used to build that dam were these horse drawn belly dump gravel wagons. These bottoms were dumped, dropping the gravel where they needed it to build the impoundment. And the wagon wheel came from one of these wagons. And they took it back to the page camp after this was all abandoned and took, made a chandelier of it. It was very, very nice. And so uh, several years later, uh, my husband and wife came in. They said, Tim, we'd like to rebuild one of those horse-drawn uh, belly dump gravel wagons. And I said, sure. And uh, we, get, we paid for the material. They went down along Lake Dam and went swimming in cold water and pulled out all the parts that they could find to the, so they could rebuild the wagon around them. This was one of the wheels. Uh, the rims that they pulled out and they came up to me after they'd done all this research trying to find these things and they said tim we we've got everything we've got a rim but we don't have a wheel we don't know what the wheels look like do you have any idea where we might be able to find one i said i might be able to help i went over and unlocked the storage shed where i'd, where I'd uh, locked that wheel up gave it to them this is the wheel that was the chandelier in the page camp and they took that wheel and from that they made uh, the other three wheels for the wagon and now this set, this is the work they did and this sets in the museum at churchill dam quite a piece of equipment and then we're on long lake we're heading north we're paddling by sam's campsite on the left or the west shore and there's an interesting story here this was a sporting camp by sam jow bear and if you paddle up the lake uh, in low water, about five, six feet offshore, you'll see a concrete pipe sticking out of the water. If you go by it at high water, that pipe is underwater. And I didn't really know what was, that was there for, but eventually talking with people and some of the locals, they said that's where Sam kept his illegal deer meat. It was a spring in the lake. He put a concrete pipe in that spring and he could put his illegal deer meat in there and he could paddle to get to the deer meat. That way the game ones couldn't track him to get to the stuff he wasn't supposed to have. And this is Sam Jalbear with his wife when they had camps on Long Lake. And I'm continuing north. On patrol, I look forward to seeing critters along the way. Uh, like this river order, but sometimes all the critters I see aren't wildlife. Sometimes might be Sam Jail Bear trying to show off in a canoe as he's going down through Long, Long Sioux Rapids. This was in National Geographic magazine in 
And I nearing the round pond is continuing. I receive a radio call I'm, uh, requesting that I meet with a local politician. This is Henderson Brook Bridge. Uh, that's been replaced with concrete now, but when the ice started moving the bridge one spring, you can see where they went back in and using chainsaws, they actually wedged logs to bring up the upstream side of the bridge back level so they could actually haul wood over the bridge. So I get at the bridge and the politician stand there with about six or seven in his party. And he said, Tim, I've got a good idea. And I said, what's that? He says, uh, I want to build an environmental camp on Round Pond for the University of Maine to use for the summer, uh, summer work study or for the students. And so what he did, he took me down to the uh, south end of the pond, about 600 feet from the high water mark, where he wanted to build a $100,000 camp. And this is an area that this politician frequented a lot. That was just kind of his summer headquarters on the Allagash. And I was worried that that might become nothing but a party spot. In fact, the trail from the camp was going to go right down through the back channel campsite. So anybody canoeing on a wilderness trip would have had to put up with that. And so I was concerned about that. And uh, it went before the budget committee in Augusta at about you know, one of those midnight hours and midnight deals. And I alerted a friend of mine that's on the committee that this camp uh, was going to try to be pushed through the budget. And he got uh, he got the money, so it was not allowed to be spent. So that camp is not on the waterway day, but it is about a mile away. And we continued down the round pond. We always enjoy seeing the last elm on the Allagash. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's how it's referred to by, by everybody I know. I never went looking for another one. And this is back channel campsite on the south end of the pond. The trail from that cabin was going to come right down through the middle of the site. And now I'll show you a map of round pond just so you can have a... Oh, okay. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So as I'm paddling by or motoring by back channel campsite, I look off to the shore on my right, and there's a giant three foot wide by two foot high memorial stone to a certain person that died and uh, bored and died. And the, the uh, scripture on it was, let me remain uh, on the place that meant so much to me, the Allagash. And uh, that was right within the high water mark of Round Pond. So I didn't think it should be there, so I loaded my canoe. I motored back up to Henderson Brook Bridge, called my ranger from Michigan Farm to come up and meet me. It was so heavy, I, um, I thought I was gonna put a hole in my aluminum canoe, but I didn't. And so the ranger met me, we put it in the back of the truck, we hauled it down to Michigan Farm, the ranger station, and we sent word down to the party that uh, they should come and get that because uh, that was not the place for that tombstone, at least I didn't feel it was. Within two weeks, I got a call from the director of park saying, that he'd heard from those people, that they'd made an extensive contribution to the governor's campaign, campaign, and why couldn't they put a tombstone on the Allagash anywhere they wanted to? And we just, you know, people love these places, but they always want to change it just a little bit. So that's just another example of, I just never knew what I was gonna run into. This is a map of Round Pond. We come down, Henderson Brook Bridge is just about right here. This is the back channel campsite. This is where that cabin was going to be. This is Squirrel Pocket Campsite over here. Jail Bear Sporting Camp, which is right here. And that was run by Willard Jail Bear. And Sue's gonna read a diary entry now. <clears throat> this is another author's note. <clears throat> Spent the night at Chamberlain Bridge with Ranger Lee Hafford. While relaxing, Lee told the following story. One hunting season, Willard and Sam Jalbeer were guiding deer hunters at Round Pond in T13 R12. Willard told Sam, Sam, tomorrow I want you to take this party deer hunting. I took them out today and one of them shot at me twice. Sam replied, Holy gee, Willard, I don't want to take him hunting if he's going to shoot at me. It's okay, Willard. It's okay, Willard. He's a poor shot. 
So I'm motoring. I hear that chainsaw and I'm motoring over to Squirrel Pocket campsite that I just pointed out. And the chainsaw is up in the woods. And I'm leading a group of 11 other people that are on an inspection trip to the Allagash. There's politicians, there's reporters, there's legislators. Uh, and so I got 11 people with me in their canoes. I get the campsite and I walk up to where I see this guy. Might just hope you say it's him. It looked a lot like him. Uh, with a chainsaw, and I didn't want to get close to him with a running saw in his hand, so I took a pine cone and I threw it at his back. He turned around, saw me, and set the chainsaw down. And I said, uh, what are you doing, Ethan? He says, I'm cutting a trail from the campsite to a nearby road. Ain't that a good idea? Uh, I said, now, Ethan, you know that's not a good idea because vehicles are parked there, and they can come down and vandalize or steal stuff from the campsite and bother the people down here. He said, you know, I got to think, and I'd say if you come along, and if you told me to stop, I'd, well, I'd stop. I said, well, Ethan, I'm telling you to stop. He thought for a minute. He said, you know, I've been thinking about what I'd say if I if you came along and told me to stop. And I guess I'll, I'd tell you that go away and leave me alone. I'm all set. And I said, I'll tell you what, Ethan, you can, you, you can use that chainsaw. You can cut the trail all you want. He had me. He, he, uh, he was smiling. He's grinning. He knew I was going away. I said, but I'm going to issue a summons to court for every day you start that chainsaw. Immediately, his face got uh, beat red, went up into his cheeks, and he said, Mr., you've made yourself an enemy. He went back, threw his chainsaw and all his gear into his canoe, which was on shore, jumped into the canoe and headed off up the pond, and I never saw him again. But this is one of the guides I was told to bring into compliance when I was hired for the job. This is my golden retriever. She was always my bow weight whenever she had an opportunity. After a full day on the water, I arrived back to Amzaska, Lake Ranger Station, where Susan has delivered uh, my four before pickup, and we ride back to Churchill Dam. Day two, of my plan is to go to Allagash Lake. Now, there are several times to get into this most remote lake in the main woods. There aren't any motors allowed on the wet lake or within one mile of the lake from May to October. So there are a number of ways for people to get there. Either paddle up 18 miles up Chamberlain Lake and then wade up Allagash Stream or Lower Allagash Stream. Drive to within one mile of the lake and portage your gear and canoe over an old road to the foot of the lake. You can drive to Upper Allagash Stream and put in up here and float down. Or you can put your canoe in at Johnson Pond Go down a little little Johnson stream, which isn't very, very big, and then get to the main river and then go to, onto the lake from there. So Sue and I are pulling down up our gas stream, and I see a very tired woman, woman sitting on shore. And I stopped to see her. She had a canoe beside her. And I said, are you okay? She says, I'm exhausted. I said, what happened? It's a very hot day. She says, well, I, I came to these beaver dams coming down Johnson Stream. That's how I plan to come in here. And so I didn't want to bother the beavers because I knew they worked hard to build those dams. So I pulled all my gear, a whole canoe load of gear, over about four different dams so I come to on that stream. And I said, well, most people will tear those dams out to live, give them enough water to float their canoe down to the main part of the river. She says, but I'm, I'm worried that that will make the beavers mad. I said, beavers love to work. I said, so I, if you do that trip again, um, I suggest you pull out the dam so you can have enough water to float your canoe. She says, you can bet, Ranger, next time those beavers will have plenty of opportunity to do more work. Continuing down the Allagash Al stream, I see a mink waiting for lunch. We come out on the 4,000 acre uh, Allagash Lake. It is the most remote lake in the main woods and the most uh, one of the most sought over, sought over experiences. This is another author's note from the diary of Tim Cavalli, March 24th, 1983. Today I flew the waterway in the main forest service plane to check lake ice conditions. Inlet of Allagash Lake is open 75 feet into the lake. I expect spring fishermen to arrive soon. Along the way, we see the southernmost nesting range of the Bonaparte Gull 
in the Arctic Turn. In the early days before roads, when they wanted to fish Allagash Lake, which is a high sought after area for uh, big trout and lake trout, they would fly sports in and their canoes with an airplane. Now, where there weren't many roads in that area, and when they flew people in, they didn't want to lug a tent and all the stoves and pots and pans every time they went. So they would build these canvas shelters and the the uh, airplane services would drop people off there and they'd be all stocked with whatever they needed except for their fresh, fresh provisions and their personal gear. Now, when the people left, there'd be, there'd be Coleman fuel, Coleman stoves, pots and pans, those kind of things, coffee pots, but they didn't want to leave them in the camp in case a canoeing party came by and might take them with them. So they would build little supply boxes, maybe 50, 60 feet out behind these canvas shelters. And that's where they'd store other pots and pans and, and those kind of, that kind of equipment. Well, Ranger Metcalf and I had heard that there was a, a, a one of those supply boxes that, to carry to the Cove campsite on Allagash Lake. And we kept trying to find it and we could never find it. So we're canoeing by the Cove site one day and a man comes down to show and he hollers at us and we go in and he said, uh, you guys been looking for that supply box that goes with the campsite here, haven't you? Yes, we have. Well, we, my dad and I found it. Well, will you show it to us? Sure, because you always don't want to find out what's in it. Maybe they left something behind, an old newspaper or something. Will you show it to us? Sure, but dad's sleeping right now. Can you come back in a couple hours? Because he's going to want to go with us. So John and I said, okay. So we went off and bought a business for a couple hours and went back. We got back and that guy comes down to shore and he said, dad's still sleeping. Let me get in your canoe. We'll go around the point, and then I'll walk you up to the woods and show you where that old supply box is. I said, great. So he got in the canoe, went around the point. He hiked us probably 200 yards up to the woods. And he said, oh, we've gone too far. He turned us around, and, and on the, as, we, as he turned us around, we saw an old bean pot that was left up there many, many years ago. We see the supply box in the distance. My friend John was a little excited, and, and he saw, started hollering, the box, the box, I see the box. He says, running up to this little supply box. What we didn't know was that the father, after we left, had come through the woods, climbed inside the box. So when John picked up the cover to see what was in it, there was this old man that started saying, Argh! scared the living heck out of the John. I'm, I'm surprised he didn't have a heart attack that day. But that box is still there behind the Cove campsite. This is an old roll dam at the outlet of Allagash Lake. And just before dark, we received a radio call from the fire tower on Allagash Lake, which is a fantastic view. Our camp is up here. And she tells us that there's a hurt party at the Cary, the Cary Trail campsite, which is right over in there. So John and I jump in our canoe to respond. And what had happened was there was a youth group coming across and they'd portage their gear a mile. Well, one of the older teenage girls uh, either didn't know or didn't tell anybody, but she was pregnant. And when she got to the carry trail campsite, she had a miscarriage. And so we're there at the edge of the dark and we got a plane come in. The plane landed at the last possible moment on the lake and was able to get that girl out and get her out to the Greenville Hospital in time. But it just, you never knew what was going to happen. We'd, we were all done for the day. We'd had a long day and we were all done, but we were pleased with that. We got, uh, felt bad about the miscarriage, but at least we got the girl out in time. While I settled into the Allagash Lake Rangers camp for the night, Susan is having her own experiences. She's 60 miles away at our headquarters at Churchill Inn. So I'm all alone with my daughter, and she was uh, young at the time. Um, I don't think she was, well, maybe a couple of years old. Um, so we went to bed real quiet. At midnight, there was one clap of thunder. And that clap of thunder was so loud that it shook the house. And we weren't that far from... Um, where the, the main area was for Churchill Dam and where they carried equipment across. Well, I didn't know what happened. So I got out and looked all around, didn't see anything. So I went to bed. 
the next morning, um, the ranger come over to the house and he said, uh, I got to ask you a question. He said, what have the guys been doing over at the, um, at the barn? I said, why? He said, there's shingles everywhere. And I said, gee, I don't know, Matt. I said, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, and I said, I, they were busy all day, but they didn't do anything with the shingles. So off he went. And all of a sudden I got to thinking, uh-oh, that clap of thunder I heard, you don't suppose it hit the barn. So I went running over and I said to Matt, let's look at the barn. And we went on the other side of the barn and lightning had hit the top. And the lightning went down the whole length of the barn and it strewed those shingles everywhere. And when we went inside, there was a big beam that had uh, been hit by the lightning. Why that place didn't burn? Because if it would have, it would have gone up like that because it's a very, very old building. It had been there uh, since the early logging area. But thank God nothing happened. But that was quite an experience to discover what happened with the lightning. And also that summer, we were having a very dry summer. We had gone probably a month or two with very little rain. And then we had a stretch where we were getting thunderstorms with a lot of lightning. And forestry was calling around and asking if we had lightning strikes. And what they told us was, maybe within one week, we will start having forest fires. And they asked if they could use Churchill Dam if they, as a staging area. And I said, Tim's at Allagash Lake, but I'm sure he wouldn't have a problem. And guess what happened? We started having the lightning in the storms. And at Churchill Dam, it has a tendency to run up and down, chase rapids. And each time it comes back, it gets worse. And uh, then we had a fire that happened not that far from us at Harrow Lake. So they called and by then Tim was back and he said yes, that they could use it as a staging area. So this is the firefighting crew come in um, and they virtually took over Churchill Dam. What we didn't know is that when we went to bed at night, there was two firefighters in our spare bedroom. The next morning there were 25 on our living room floor, also all tucked into sleeping bags. Right, and this is the fire that was over Harrow Lake at T10, R11. And uh, it lasted, what, well over a week. Yeah, they brought uh, crews in, helicopters, float planes that could drop water. Uh, it was a very, very busy time for us. Fortunately, it was contained, so it didn't get into where it did property damage or, or uh, danger anybody. Right, so one of the guys come over and he said to me, I know you're busy. He said, but I have to ask a favor of you. And I said, sure. He said, we need somebody to help make sandwiches. Would you come over and help make sandwiches? So for a solid week, I made sandwiches and put them in bags. And I'll tell you, at the end of that week, I never wanted to see another bologna sandwich again. So uh, they brought an administrative crew from Augusta up to handle payroll, comp time, any injuries are reported, those kind of things. Uh, and one of the, the uh, administrative personnel, her name was Willie. And after four or five days, we, we were exhausted. We all went to bed. I left my uh, work boots down by the stairs. I got up the next morning and my work boots were missing. Well, I remembered that uh, the night before there had been a firefighter that was having a heart attack while he was on the line. And the pilot had sent word over that he needed Willie in the helicopter because they had to take him out to Prescott Hospital. And I can remember her saying, I don't know CPR. I don't know anything. 
They said, never mind. The pilot needs you. You need to go. So she went over and jumped in the helicopter and flew out to Presque Isle. Well, she was a very pretty lady, and the pilot knew he was going to have to remain in Presque Isle overnight. And so he didn't want to be alone while he's in Presque Isle with one of the administrative clerks. The next morning, I got up. I'm looking for my boots and anywhere around. And Willie comes in through the uh, front door. She, in her in her rush, she jumped into my hiking boots, and she'd worn them all night long when she went to Presque Isle. So the mystery of the lost boots was uh, was solved. And so this ends our 48-hour uh, visit to New England's uh, premier wilderness area. And this is so that there was an issue down to Long Lake Dam uh, where a uh, person tried to canoe uh, Long Lake Dam on a inflatable raft and one of the spikes from the old dam came up and nicked the person. So she went with me to help with that. Uh, these are a four uh, book a series. We call it the James Clark Saga. James Clark is fictional, but whatever he deals with, what I dealt with is the main park ranger. Uh, solace is the summertime. In the wintertime, Jim's on patrol and he walks over a mound of snow. He breaks through into a brush pile. While he's in there, he can hear bear cubs crying underneath him. And that happened to me. And it's extremely hard to get out of a brush pile with bear, with uh, when you know there's a bear underneath you with snowshoes on. But I did get out and before the mother came awake. And then the ranger's wife, uh, a lot of what Sue and other ranger's wives went through up there. And then from within political intrigue on the Allegash with Ranger Clark. And this is our newest book, uh, just came out at the beginning of this month. Uh, my brother was in Baxter for 46 years. I was on the, on the uh, Park Service for 32 years. And um, there's a, so there's a, a, just a smitten of the stories. We've got about 30 stories in there uh, of what we went through. Uh, and uh, it's, folks been very kind with it so far. And uh, so we do have that available as well. We was at a school in Alton uh, this, uh, earlier this year. And when I got done talking to the fourth grade, a little girl come up to me and she said, I think your books will help my reading strategy. Well, I'm, well, I'm pleased about that. Then a little, book came, a little boy come up and he said, you know, I thought this was, was going to be boring, but it wasn't. So, <laughs> so thank you for being with us. We can open the floor to any questions. Thank you. You want to put up the slide for the the next slide? It should be the uh, contact information. Yeah. Wondering when you're out there working, how much of that time are you by yourself? Quite a lot on any given day. Uh, I might know go miles and not see anybody. Um, I might get into that group of oversized group, and so I'll be with them quite a while trying to straighten that out and get them separated so that we're within the regulations. Uh, I just never knew. Um, I could go 10 miles and not see a soul. Uh, I could go around the corner and see the guy running the chainsaw or the stone or something I have to deal with. If you need help, back up. How, how far away are they? Uh, generally, if I was on Round Pond, the, the nearest ranger that could help me was 25 miles away. And that was that was by vehicle. Uh, he, he could come 20 miles by canoe, but in low water, the Allegash River gets very low. And for folks that want to do the water, uh, the, the river trip, six, 600 CFS is reasonable canoeing. Anything above that is even better. Uh, but two summers ago, it got down to 300 CFS. So people were, in fact, they were, they were walking so much to the Allegash a store in St. Francis was selling T-shirts that said, I hiked the Allagash. A loud mouth. Anyway, uh, actually, I have three quick questions. Uh, you may, you uh, talked about the beaver dams on uh, Johnson, the street between Johnson and Pablo Allagash Lake. Um, are you allowed to remove those or... Breach opening leg because I remember when my wife went down and I went down there. We, those are really hard to get over, you know, especially coming back. And uh, 
you know, is there any law against that? No, it's very common to breach those dams, very, generally right in the middle, so you're not going to bring a lot of mud in off from the shores, but breach them in the middle. Uh, it takes a little work to do that because they are very creative and good builders, but no, it's not illegal. And the breachers, they're supposed to there. What time of year do they leave? I mean, when do they, is it at the end of August? Generally, it's after the fall fishing. Because uh, that's a very busy place when they come in to get the fall fishing and the and the the brook trout are spawning uh, and uh, you know you can get a three or four uh, five pound brook trout up there. Uh, Gen generally, uh, first week of October, maybe second week of October. They also will do boundary line work during that time when the when it's not quite so hot because there's a uh, uh, a blazed orange boundary line uh, five to eight hundred feet away from the high water mark all around the waterway to show that state property. Now, is there uh, I see some ads for camping and expeditions in the winter time. Are there people who do that? I mean, yeah, to provide guidance. Uh, ice fishing is very big up there. You'll see ice shacks on Eagle and Chamberlain Lake. There are some dog sledders that will go up there. Uh, I have some very close friends that you'll read about in my book, Conversations, uh, where they snowshoe um, and ski the Allagash in the wintertime. But the, the river is very tricky, and reading the water in the wintertime as compared to the summertime is extremely different. Um, we'd moved into Omsaska's headquarters our first uh, first year, and one night it was 25 below zero. And there's no road to our headquarters. We had to uh, drive a snow sled a mile to get to our vehicle. We're 14 miles from the nearest people, uh, the, which is Clayton Lake. Uh, there's no fishing on Omsaskis um, Lake in the wintertime, so there's no reason for anybody to be there. And so it's about 25, almost 30 below zero. Eight o'clock one morning, we come and knock on the door. And we didn't know whether we wanted to answer it or not. And so I do did answer it, and there's a couple that's on their honeymoon trip as they were snowshoeing the Allagash. And they've been camped the night before across the lake at the Ledges campsite, and they saw our lights, our propane lights that night, so they come over to see us the next morning. And we met them there, and we've been very close friends ever since. Uh, in your many years as a, as a ranger, did you ever go on vacation, and did you go camping? <laughs> That would be our busman's holiday. If the ranger, uh, sometimes if, if we were short on staff, uh, at the time we had a roving ranger that fill in when another ranger went out so the area would be covered. But if we were short on staff for whatever reason, we would fill in while the ranger was gone and might be on our days off. And normally I, I had weekends off simply because the Augusta office wanted to be in touch with me if they had issues that came up and needed, needed to get in touch with me. But so yeah, we took the... We'd spend a lot of time camping on the Allagash. So when when you were on vacation, did you go like Hawaii or Florida? Or? No, we, we generally would go someplace south in the wintertime for, for a few weeks. That's what was a quieter time for us. But we also camped at Cops Cook Bay State Park. That's where I was for several years as the park manager. But uh, we enjoyed the outdoors. Can you tell me what the scariest situation was that you were ever in in your career up there? You'll... Uh, you can read about that in our book, Heading North. Um, that was a very turbulent area when I went in. Uh, that's why I had those three uh, assignments that they gave me. And uh, I followed the the second supervisor in there um, and rode in with him. And we went to that lodge. And he said, I'll show you how to light the refrigerator. And so we went in and he says, it's remarkable to me that you use heat to make cold because it's propane refrigerator. So we got down. And he uh, pushed the pilot button to light the propane. Uh, well, while he was out, someone had gone in and they loosened a knot on one of the gas lines. So when he pushed that pilot button and held the, the match up to light the, the pilot, that line let go and a stream of flame came out and burned his, the, uh, um, the hair off his eyebrows. He fell back. Uh, <laughs> swearing a little bit. Immediately had to have a half a glass of whiskey. Um, and he sat down and he said, I've been going through this for nine years of vandalism, uh, water in his gas tank, windows broken, files broken into. Uh, and that was one of the people, the disgruntled employees. That was the one I was supposed to straighten out. Two years later, we lost that place to our home. So that was probably the hardest on the family. Yes, sir. Uh, this per... 
well no, nowadays we'd have trail cameras and all that stuff we had rangers that would be stationed in the headquarters uh you know um out of sight supposedly uh but this person came and went as, as he did it's so isolated up there that's pretty easy um he, he confessed to me once that he was setting off the edge of our dock at 10 o'clock at night watching us through the picture window and because we were the only place so we we'd come and go with our showers and stuff and uh but uh it went on for a very very long time and uh, but he had a yeah I'll, I'll save the rest of my opinion uh so thanks so much for being with us today i'm over here hi um so my question is are there um like I, so we have we have canoed on the in the boundary waters and you know you have to have certain reservations in order to start in a certain place and that kind of thing how what's the management like up there is it crowded can you always find a campsite how far apart are they those kinds of things i'm sure i can find them all on www.allagashtales.com but i'd love to hear from you now too thank you um the the bureau was so concerned with wilderness management they actually um sponsored me to go to boundary waters i went out and spent a week with those folks and learning their management and how they manage campsites so they are in environmental danger with the washing of mud every time it rains and those kind of things uh the allagash is very busy uh after school gets out and when the kids groups start coming uh but don't put in on a friday or saturday try to do a monday or a tuesday and if you do get in with a group unless you either hang back or get ahead of them you have a tendency to travel with that group all the way through uh, i haven't heard of any problems in recent years where there wasn't enough campsites for everybody um it was it kind of slowed down it was very busy in the 80s and kind of slowed down and then once COVID hit it started picking up again because people want to get away from everybody else um but i haven't ha heard any overcrowding a uh, couple of summers we were actually we were assigning campsites a ranger would start at the north end of the allagash and then when he met a party he'd sign him to an empty site until he met the next party and then sign him to the next empty site so we did do that for a few years but i don't understand i haven't heard there's a problem up there now a few years ago in this very room the author paul Dyron spoke to us about his um, fictitious warden mike bowditch in a very popular series and i've read them all and I just wondered if if that gentleman ever came to you for some background information or tall tales, you know. No, and I, and I've read those stories, uh, and I enjoy the I enjoy the series by Dor and Um, I guess my pride in what Sue and I do is that the books that we have are based on that we've walked that ground. You know, we didn't have to do research; we lived it. Uh, and this, uh, we try to make them a little bit fun, but be actual too with what uh, rangers deal deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, and the most um i'll share one last story with you we always had some youth groups that would come in and do projects and uh there was this one guy named sheldon and he had gorgeous long hair his clothes weren't always clean but, but his hair was always clean and he's doing a project i think digging an outhouse hole for the ranger with a couple other guys and i went down to him one day and he said you're treating us just like laborers we're, we're just grunts and i'm tired of it with the, i'm tired of the black flies and i want to leave i said give us a couple of weeks you know you're doing important work you're going to serve people from all over the world come to allegash give it a couple of weeks and he did and two weeks later he came to me and he kind of scuffed the ground like that and uh, i said uh, what can i do for you sheldon he said well i live in lewiston he says anyway i can stay up here he says uh, in lewiston all i hear is sirens i don't want to hear sirens anymore thank you <laughs>